Okay, good afternoon and welcome. I'm your session moderator. My name is Kelly Clark and I'm a member of the Michigan OER Network Steering Committee. Um, I have a few housekeeping items to share before we get started. First, we ask that you keep your microphone on mute. You can ask your questions at any time by entering them into the chat. We will be saving all questions until the end of the presentation. Secondly, we are recording this session. And then lastly, closed captioning is available throughout the session. So I am going to hand over the, uh, the I'm gonna hand everything over to Una and everybody, the pre presenters will introduce themselves. Thank you, Kelly. I um, appreciate that. Um, and I wanna thank all of you for joining us um, this afternoon to hear about navigating uncertain times with open education. And I'm so happy to be presenting with three OER champions uh, from the Community College Consortium for OER who have led open education programs at their colleges before and during the pandemic to help students, particularly those from traditionally underserved communities and faculty navigate difficult times through the adoption of OER and open educational practices. So on to introductions. So you've kind of met me, I'm Una Daly, the director of the Community College Consortium for OER. We abbreviate that CCCOER, so you may hear me refer to it that way. And we're part of a large glo global organization called Open Education Global. And I'd like to pass it to Dr. Christina Bailey. Uh, Christina, let's see, you're um, muted. I'm gonna... There you go. Okay, there. Thank you. <laughs> I couldn't do it myself. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy to be here with you today. Um, my name is Christina Bailey. I am the Director of Academic Services at Henry Ford College and an instructor for STEM. Thank you, Christina. And uh, Joseph, please introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Joseph Mould. I'm the Executive Director for Online Learning at Bay College. Uh, I've been involved with Open Educational Resources uh, through the Achieving the Dream grant that received back in 2016. And so uh, I've been involved uh, since about 2015 with our OER initiatives here at Bay. Thank you, Joseph. And um, Shinta, Dr. Shinta Hernandez. Hi, thank you, Una. Hi, everybody. I'm happy to be here. My name is Shinta Hernandez, and I am the founding dean of the virtual campus at Montgomery College. We're located in the state of Maryland, right outside of Washington, D.C., and I oversee the virtual offerings as well as OER efforts at the college. Thank you, Shinta. And um, Shinta is also on the CCCOER Executive Council. So as you probably noticed, Two of our panelists are in Michigan and one is Maryland. And I think um, it's, a, it's a great uh, combination to hear about what's happening both within the state and also outside the state. So just before we get started, I'd like to, for those of you who might be new to CCCOER, just wanted to mention a little, thing, a little bit about it. Um, CCCOER was founded in 2007 on the premise that OER could help students succeed, particularly through access for traditionally underserved students. And that remains a North Star for many of us in the open education field, but we broadened our focus at CCCOER over the years to include open educational practices and policies. And our membership includes hundreds of colleges across North America, um, including those in Michigan. Um, through the Michigan Colleges Online, has been a longtime member of CCCOER, Bay College, Lansing College, and Northwestern College have actually also been individual members over the years. Now, as a community of practice uh, for open education, we provide resources, support, and opportunities for collaboration um, on learning and implementing successful open education programs. So um, some of the activities are sharing best practices in monthly webinars. And Dr. Hernandez here uh, heads up that committee that, that organizes that. Um, and I hope that if you haven't attended some of those that you will in the future, and um, there's a link at the bottom of this page um, to get on our email list if you would like to hear about those activities. And these are free and open to the community. Um, we uh, sponsor um, online advocacy events. Um, open Education Week is actually uh, 
uh, sponsored and hosted by Open Education Global, our parent organization. We have a very active community email list. So if you need peer support from other uh, leaders in OER and faculty, that's a great place to get it. Um, we also do case studies um, featuring um, institutions who are growing and sustaining their open education program. So next on to today's topic. So <laughs> community colleges, and please do enter in any questions you might have in, in the chat. Um, we're happy to answer them in the chat as we go along and then we'll open it up uh, for uh, more verbal uh, communication, <laughs> audio communication uh, at the end here. So I think we, all know that community colleges were the hardest hit sector of public higher education during the pandemic and students lives were disrupted in many ways. Um, the pandemic exposed inequities, not only in education, but healthcare, housing, etc. And um, so our colleges were striving to help students, particularly those from traditionally underserved communities, uh, to stay enrolled, to persist and be successful. And so our panelists here today are gonna tell you about what they've done at their colleges. Um, and uh, you'll hear about lessons learned, successes, um, et cetera. And we hope that you might be able to apply this at your own college. Uh, some of the some of these uh, this great advice from these these champions. So just to set a little bit of context before we jump into the panel is CCCOER does an annual survey with its members every year, and um, because we want to take their pulse on what's happening, hear about their successes and their challenges, um, and also how we can support them going forward. Um, and so we were really thrilled to see this year that 68% um, of our respondents said that interest in OER had grown at their college over the last year. And now let, when we, over the 2022 um, school year, 2021-22 school year, because we administered this in May. And the previous year, it was only 41%. So we know that the interest continues to grow. I think um, our panelists will share more about that with you too, what they're hearing from faculty. There's a real deep realization now that OER is high quality uh, and it helps our students succeed. And in many cases, it can be very helpful for faculty as well in terms of providing those materials to their students. Um, so we were really thrilled about that. And um, as you can see, our organizations that our members, our institutions are really very varied between individual colleges, multi-college systems, and then statewide members such as Michigan Colleges Online. And finally, um, I wanted to also report on what they let us know about the most successful aspect of their program. And you can see on the, the blue bar is 2021 and the red bar is 2022. So saving students money is always a, a very popular um, success metric and, and we don't negate that. But we were really thrilled to see that in 2022, although that still does remain uh, the largest uh, success aspect, increasing student persistence went up considerably. So there's the recognition that open education can help students be persist persistent. Um, and the other two aspects of this were enhancing teaching and learning and also it, uh, promoting and um, fostering equity, diversity and inclusion. So um, really, really great results. And um, I, I hope that um, those resonate with many of you out there as well. All right. So I want to, um, without further ado, want to get started with our panel here. And um, we're going to start with the first question. And let, let me just ask um, my panelists, are you comfortable with me um, stopping sharing right now so that, um, I, I mean, I'll give you the questions or would you prefer I leave the questions um, on the screen? What's your preference? I'll leave the question. You'd like to have us leave the questions on the screen, Christina? Okay, yeah. that's fine with me. Okay, so well, let's let's start with our first question. Tell us a little bit about the open education journey at your college, and how the pandemic changed or perhaps sharpened your focus. And um, Christina, would you like to start with that one? Yes, Una. Thank you. Thank you. So the story of. Uh... The journey of OER at Henry Ford College is a very short one, but it's a very good and happy one. Um, in the winter of 2020, a few months after the Office of Academic Services was created and I was hired as director, um, 
we have just a small package of OER. Uh, they just six courses where uh, we're using OER. So with the information in the education we gathered through Michigan colleges online and the support of my vice president and the president of Henry Ford College, we were able to start a campaign of information and education. We brought OER speakers to the campus. We promote heavily the Friday faculty conversation with Kat Wickerly through the Michigan colleges online. And uh, by the winter of 2022, we were able to save our students from a few thousands in 2020. Now we save our students close to one and a half million dollars in, uh, in OER materials. And there are more than 78 courses now involved with this. So our journey continues. Um, there is a lot of interest now among faculty members. We are a community college. We serve a large percentage of immigra immigrants and underserved communities. So this is very important uh, for us. Um, just two weeks ago, we have a hybrid presentation in which 18 faculty members who were awarded a small amount of grant money to work not in creation, but in adoption, in adoption of OER, uh, present their findings, and we are hoping that by the winter of 2023, those OER materials will be introduced into their courses with great savings for, for our students. Thank you, Christina. Wow. In two years, you have come so far at Henry Ford, and I know that it's been under your leadership because this um, well, I would say that there is a small committee of OER that works very hard. It's not just me. Uh, there is a dean, there is a librarian, and there is um, um, somebody from the uh, Writing Resource Center. So it's not just me. It's a small group of people, and we are all working together uh, for, for this result. Yeah, of course. We get that. It's a team effort always. Thank you. And Joseph, would you like to go next? Sure. I'm happy to stop the screen share, too. If you want to stop sharing your screen so that we can go to full video mode, um, <laughs> if you want to. I, I'm happy to do that. It's just, um, uh, uh, yeah. OK, no problem. So um, first of all, I would like to say thank you to Una, because I think our journey would have been uh, non-existent without uh, CCC OER. Una was crucial to um, to all of the steps in us applying to the Achieving the Dream grant. Um, we were a little bit ahead of the game because we, um, you know, had started working on OERs a little bit before the grant became available. But I remember being at a conference with Una. And she was like, hey, did you hear about this grant? You know, it should be a good opportunity. And, um, and uh, it was funny, I got back from the conference and the president of the college was like, hey, did you hear about this grant? It'd be a great opportunity. And so um, we applied to the grant and uh, we're lucky enough to get the grant. And so um, the, Achieving the, Dream, the Achieving the Dream grant was $100,000 that we received back in 2016. And um, we worked very uh, hard, um, again, a team effort. Uh, it was the faculty really that was, they were super interested uh, in open educational resources. And um, a lot of faculty jumped on board and we quickly had a complete uh, degree in, in the Associate of Arts uh, pathway, a degree pathway that was using all open educational resources within two years. Uh, the grant was a three-year grant and we had actually um, had that path completed in about two years. And so it was, um, it was a wild ride through that grant, but um, um, that grant is really uh, the reason why we've been so successful and have been able to um, continue to focus on OERs. The pandemic has increased online learning enrollment significantly and hybrid enrollment significantly. And, um, and so the more students that are online, they're looking for the materials online. And um, I am increasingly aware of how difficult it has become to work with publishers and access codes 
and um, and the how easy it is to access open educational resources on the very first day. So um, our continued growth through the pandemic was in large part due to the continued growth of online learning and hybrid learning. Um, and so uh, getting people access and ease of access was, uh, I think, a large part of why we continue to grow. Thank you, Joseph. And um, I have to say you overstated my importance, but hey, <laughs> I'll take it. Um, so um, I, and I understand that ATD, the ATD OER degree program was really foundational. And then you were able to take advantage of that and keep moving forward during the pandemic as things went online. So that's, yeah, really, really great to hear. Um, and, Sh and Shinta, tell us about Montgomery College. Thank you, Una. Thank you for inviting me to be a part of this. I get, as you know, I get really excited when I can share about Montgomery College's work because of just like the two institutions uh, on the panel, it was a, a major team effort. It was a cross-functional team working together. And so our work similarly started with the 2016 Achieving the Dream OER degree grant as well. And in fact, I remember when I was at the kickoff meeting, uh, I, I recall a table on the other side of the ballroom that was all Bay College. So Joseph, maybe you and I were in the same room together and just didn't know it at the time. Um, but through this OER grant, when we first officially began, um, we had a, a group of champions, um, true advocates of this work who knew right from the beginning how important this work would be, even before everybody else at the institution uh, knew about it or knew of it, um, of its impact. And so today, uh, something, something else I wanna share with you also about Montgomery College is that we're the largest community college in the state of Maryland, and also recently ranked as the most diverse community college in the continental United States. So OER is of utmost priority for us for a lot of different reasons. And so thinking about where we are today, since the time we officially started, we have saved over $9 million in textbook savings. We just did a recent count. We have almost 600 Z sections, Z meaning Z, Z courses, uh, Z degree um, or Z zero costs rather, and nearly 600 Z sections with nearly 11,000 student enrollments. And that again is really a testament to the collective effort here at the college. And then now thinking about how the pandemic has changed our focus, I think what really has allowed us to grow in this space is now we're doing a deeper focus on social justice. We touched on it a little bit even before the pandemic, but since the pandemic, we have looked into um, open pedagogical strategies that we're now um, incorporating into so many of our classes. And we have fellowships that touch on open pedagogy in addition to continuing helping our faculty develop open educational resources. Yeah, I would like to echo some of what Shinta just said was that um, uh, in addition to the increase in online students and hybrid students, we also have the increase of folks that are requiring assistive technology and um, open educational resources are so much easier to use screen readers with and uh, to access um, for accessibility issues. Um, and so I think that is also a crucial step. I know our director of accessibility is always very thankful when they have an open educational resource to work with, when you compare and contrast it to a publisher's materials that are on lockdown uh, and some uh, piece of software that isn't necessarily an audiobook. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Joseph. I was just looking at quick facts or fast facts from the American Association of Community Colleges and 20% of our students at community colleges um, uh, self-represent as having dis disabilities. So they are definitely in need of that accessibility. Um, so I'd like to go into our next question. Um, and how does your campus or college center students from underserved communities and faculty? Uh, through either OER or open educational practices. And um, I'm happy to let whoever would like to go first. Um... Okay, I can go. Oh, thank you, Christina. Um, well, our journey, like I said, uh, for uh, 
for open educational practices start right now with our OER practices, with our uh, adoption of OER materials. And we are going to continue to grow and expand our open educational practice to be more than just OER in the near future. But we do also serve uh, traditionally underserved communities. We have a small population of uh, uh, urban um, students. We have a small population of Hispanic students, and we have a large population of immigrant students. Uh, which English is not the first language. So in these cases, we have an institute of uh, an ELI, so English Language Institute, that the students can take those courses and become proficient in English before they move in into the uh, credit uh, courses at the college. Um, we also, and I echo what you said about the students with disability, in our colleges, about 20% the population of our students who now report to have some type of disability. So those are the students too that we are trying to serve, not also through OER, but to make those accessible. And so the campaign to make accessibility a very important part of our colleges now is an, is an every day uh, through accessibility trainings, to Blackboard Ally, to make many different uh, tools that we have to help uh, to help our students. Thank you, Christina. Yeah, very important work. Um, Joseph or Shinta, would you like to? Um, I, was, I would say that uh, we serve, so for those of you that don't know, Bay College is in the upper peninsula of Michigan, and we are in Escanaba, Michigan. And so we serve students. I mean, our student body is uh, over 70% are TRIO eligible, uh, which means, you know, they're either first generation students, uh, they're students that um, that meet the qualifications to be TRIO students and to, to get a little of the additional assistance. And so we have a lot of students that struggle with internet connections and um, struggle with uh, paying for data and just struggle in general. And so having open educational resources where they can download them to their device or to their phone um, allows them to access those materials without having an internet connection. Um, and it is something that the digital divide is very real in the Upper Peninsula. It's something we're working hard to try to close, but it's still a problem. Um, and so open educational resources allow students to download materials to their devices without an end time, without a without losing access to them like they would with a publisher. And so, um, you know, that is an important uh, group of students that we serve. And we also, I think one of the things that I really like about open educational resources is that when you see a group of people being left out, you can change that. Um, you can change the images in your open educational resources, right? I mean, if you're not seeing your students represented, put images of your students in those materials. Um, I mean, quite literally, put your students in those materials. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice way to be able to edit um, those materials. And you know, we, have, we have taken open educational resources and created our own textbooks. Uh, and I saw that as an opportunity to, um, one, improve the accessibility of some of those OERs because we took the time to caption the videos and, um, and we took the time to make sure there were alt tags on some complicated images um, because not all OERs are 100% um, accessible. And so um, I think that's important. Um, here at Bay, we, we have a very stout athletics program. And, um, and so our college population is different than the rest of the population in Escanaba because uh, we have more students of color. We have more BIPOC students, right? Black, indigenous, people of color uh, students on our campuses and being able to represent them in our materials is really crucial and OERs makes it very easy for you to do that. Thank you for that, Joseph. Yeah, and that's very interesting. As you said, you have more on campus than are in the community at large. Uh, and some of that is due to your athletic program. Yep. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know um, you mentioned uh, changing the images um, and certainly that that's uh, an open license makes that possible. Also changing the text. 
um, you know, um, places where um, historically um, certain communities were left out, uh, certainly their successes were left out. Of the yeah, history. and you know, that is one of the things that, um, you know, we have a very large uh, Native American population here, the Hannibal Inter Indian community is, um, it's, they have been crucial to funding uh, a lot of our athletics facilities. And um, we have a lot of students from the Hannibal community um, that are our students here. And uh, their voice and the decolonization of our instructional materials is crucial to uh, truly hearing and understanding the voice of our you know, uh, indigenous brothers and sisters. And so uh, that's an important piece, uh, you know, often, um history is called his story um, because the other story isn't being told open educational resources gives us an opportunity mm -hmm. to open and correct that thank you oh shinta tell us about uh, montgomery college well thank you Una. um and in fact joseph's uh statement about decolonization really is a good segue to how i'm going to answer this question but before I do, I just want to give a brief background of, of MC. Montgomery College is a minority serving institution. So we officially have these, these designations from the US Department of Education. So we have large percentage of African-Americans, Hispanics, Asians. Um, we also have a large percentage of first generation students. And while Montgomery County is an affluent county, we have a, a very large percentage of Pell eligible students. So clearly, a very big need um, for open pedagogy and open education. And so therefore at Montgomery College, we have a sharp focus on decolonization of our curriculum. And so that is the approach or the process of deconstructing those colonial ideologies and the privilege of Western thought and approaches to, to teaching and learning. And so we have um, several uh, practices, a couple of fellowships that really hone in on ways in which faculty can learn how to intersect open education with the decolonization of, of the curriculum. And one of the programs that we have is actually pairing up faculty with students so that the students play a major role in course redesign with that faculty member. What an amazing you know, active learning or experiential learning experience for them. It's almost like an internship, if you will, where the faculty and the students can learn how to create an inclusive syllabus, for example, or um, think about more culturally responsive assignments um, or, or just getting feedback from, from students along the way and making sure that, it, that that piece is intentional. So we have um, these, the decolonization of, of our practices is a very top priority. Thank you, Shinta. And I, you know, I know that um, it, it, as I, um, Joseph shared I think it, they're a small college in an upper peninsula, Michigan. And, and Christina, I, I believe you shared too, you're a medium-sized college in um, kind of more the center of Michigan. And Mer uh, Montgomery College is quite a large college, 50,000 enrollments, right? So, yeah. <laughs> so they're, I think, maybe triple what Christina is and I don't know, quadruple, maybe more than. Um, so keep that in mind as you hear these um, at the larger colleges, there do tend to be more resources for these programs, but Montgomery College still, I mean, I'm not trying to take anything away. They're a role model um, in so many ways to so many of us. All right, well, I wanted, I think we're doing great on time. So um, I, I want to give you guys an opportunity to say, what's next for sustaining and growing your open educational programs and to continue to maintain that focus on equity and social justice. Um, and Christina, would you like to start again or? Sure, yes, thanks, Una. So for us at Henry Ford College, and I have to say that we have excellent support for my vice president of academic affairs, Dr. Nilan, and for my president, uh, uh, Ras Cavaluna, we have great support from them. Uh, so that is very important. We are not, we are not alone. And the faculty, uh, they understand the importance of this and more and more they are coming on board. We are going to have a second round of grants. And, and I'm telling you, like I say, we are a 
12,000 student at college, we don't have too much money to go around, but with the small amount that we give to, uh, to faculty members, I think we are seeing, uh, we're seeing great progress. Um, another thing that we do though for our students, and I should mention this, when the pandemic started, we started to provide computers to all of our students so they can access the materials online, their online classes. So not only we move our online classes like everyone else, but we provide our students, we went shopping and to this day, the program continues. Any student who needs a laptop, it is available free of charge uh, to borrow from, from Henry Ford College. That's wonderful. And yeah, it's it's very impressive what you've done, um, uh, Christina. And this second round will be very exciting because you've learned so much during the first round, even though you had large successes. I'm sure that you'll there will be some things that you will change up um, in the second uh, round. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, all right. Uh, okay. <laughs> we seem to be going in the same order each time and it's working. So Joseph, we'll let you go next if, if you're okay. Sure. With that. I think that, you know, there's been, uh, for us anyhow, um, our recent conversions to open educational resources have been uh, with faculty that have had less than positive experiences with publishers. And um, there was an instance where publisher X um had you know students had purchased access to the textbook and then the students were getting pushed with little advertisement when they logged in to purchase an unlimited access uh, to this particular publisher which was leading them to believe that their the access that they had purchased would expire in roughly 14 days and so many students went ahead and did the unlimited plan when it was unnecessary. And so, um, which caused additional hardships for our students. And so um, I pursued the publisher to make sure that all of our students were refunded and that those advertisements went away immediately. And uh, the next semester, our uh, faculty uh, decided to go ahead and um, transition to a open educational resource um, because of the chaos and uh, lack of access um, the students had and blatant kind of, uh, um, I don't know, just uh, corporate commercialization of the product and taking advantage of students, uh, it really turned the faculty off. And uh, they it became then uh, their reason for transitioning to an open educational resource. I will say um, our growth has certainly slowed, but currently we have uh, over 40 classes that are OERs or open educational resources. And that does, that is not counting the number of sections um, because for every one of those 40, um, those are individual classes that then have, you know, uh, different uh, sections, right? They all have a variable number of sections associated with them because the lead faculty picks the textbook and then that textbook is used across all cl all classes. And, uh, and in those instances, we have been very successful in um, our faculty. Uh, we haven't had very many faculty go back to publisher products. However, we have had one and it was a lab class and it was significant. So it was kind of a blow to our Associates of Arts degree. Uh, and the reason was because um, the publisher's product was just the best way for them to go because the ancillary materials were not there for this particular uh, world, you know, regional geography uh, course. and. Um, and, and so uh, they transitioned back to a publisher's product, but that is the only one of that I am aware of that, that actually went back to a publisher's product. And, and so um, we still do encourage faculty with stipends. Um, we, we try to provide adequate funding to faculty to transition. I think it's important to remember that this is a lot of work to transition from a publisher's product to an open educational resource and that we can't forget our adjunct faculty and make sure that we're we're paying our adjunct faculty to do the work in their classes 
Um, that is something that we tried to address during our Achieving the Dream um, uh, grant initiative. But uh, there is still interest. And I think that um, we were so overwhelmed with uh, the number of people we had to support through COVID. Uh, as you know, um, new initiatives have kind of uh, just taking a back seat and, and people just did not have the bandwidth to to pursue these ideas. But I, I do think that we're in a much better place now. And uh, this is something that we want to revise on our campus and continue to pursue. So um, and I will say this about open educational resources. It is an act of to me open educational resources, when I first got into this community, it just seemed like a cult because people were so like over the top about it, you know, and just in love with it. And, you know, it's it, it's because I think the reason why open educational resources are, are kind of like that is because, um, well, it, it cuts to the heart of why we are in education. It's sharing information without any sort of expectations. And, you know, it's just openly sharing information, you know, and I think that that is why we have people that are passionate about open, open educational resources. It is truly the heart of why a lot of us are in education. It's sharing information openly. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Joseph. Um, I, I do think many of us are called to it because of that, that, that freedom and, um, yeah, unfettered access. All right, uh, Shinta, uh, tell us about um, what's the next steps at Montgomery College. Sure, thanks, Una. So Montgomery College will continue to offer robust professional development opportunities. We will help uh, more and more faculty and staff, front-facing staff especially, uh, develop OERs in all the modalities. Um, so on-campus classes, our synchronous remote classes, asynchronous online classes. We just wanna be able to have open educational resources be available in, in no matter the class modality. We will also continue um, uh, providing opportunities for faculty to engage in some of these open tools and platforms like Pressbooks and H5P. And I mentioned fellowships earlier. We will also continue with our fellowships. In fact, actually, I had talked about the, the decolonization fellowship earlier. One of, the, one of our next steps is to actually open that up to have a multi-state collaboration. So we're really excited about um, seeing how we can maximize community and student impact uh, through a multi-state collaboration. So that's gonna be exciting. We also have another fellowship that I'm developing with our dual enrollment office that is going to be for e-faculty in dual enrollment and teaching them how to develop open educational resources for the dual enrollment classes that they offer. So those are just some of the things that are part of our next steps to-do list at Montgomery College. Wow, and that, that's exciting. And I know that the dual enrollment is, uh, is an equity issue as well. Um, who, is, who is actually taking advantage of those dual enrollments? Are we sure that it's really, um, being distributed in an equitable manner. Yeah, I would like to add on to the dual enrollment. We have a huge number of students that are dual enrolled here at Bay College. And, you know, when the administrators of those high schools see that we're using open educational resources, it just makes them more attractive to that because they didn't have, they don't have to pay for the textbook. Uh, I mean, and, and if the student does want a physical copy, it's it's much less than it, it would, it's publisher's counterpart part is. So for dual enrolled students, open educational resources are crucial to our success with dual enrolled students because administrators love it when we use OERs, so do the students. Wonderful. And um, I, I know several of you mentioned when we got together uh, last week that um, you had a prof you, you continue to do professional development with your faculty and um, that there is a focus on social justice. Um, and that I think many faculty really can resonate with that. But um, sometimes that can make the difference uh, for faculty who are kind of on the fence and who are very attached to their um, publishers ancillary materials like the test banks and the slides but more and more the materials are out there, uh, particularly for the intro courses and um, when there's an opportunity to faculty within a discipline to work together and I suspect uh, uh, Christina that some of your stem faculty um, could work together to develop those materials um, that might be missing from an OER. Um, 
So um, I want to open it up to questions from the audience. Um, thank you for being a great audience out there. We've had over 50 people join us. Um, and we'd love to answer your questions now. Feel free to unmute yourself, um, or you could raise your hand if you if you're not able to unmute yourself directly. Well, while we're waiting for folks to uh, jump in with some questions, um, would anyone like to talk about the professional development that um, they're working on for this year? Because we're still early in the 22-23 academic year, and I, I wonder if uh, folks have uh, professional development um, opportunities for faculty to, for maybe those who haven't um, got into OER yet, or we know that a lot of OER out there, um, it can be very high quality, but it might look a lot like textbook publisher material in the sense that uh, it may not be representative of the students. Uh, if it's a history book, there might be missing history. And that, but the OER, of course, makes it possible to change that, but um, that also requires the subject matter experts or our faculty to do that work. And would anyone like to share about that? Or how about, how about a student that you've helped at your college that maybe perhaps for some reason you've had a personal relationship with and you've seen OER or open educational practices directly impact that student? I know I occasionally have the pleasure of meeting students like that. Um, we do a set of student stories and we're always happy to publish student stories. Um, and we give small gift cards to the students who participate in that. Um, because um, I think uh, for most of us who come into education, it's because we want to be that mentor for that student, for the, the students out there that need need it. Yeah, I think that one that resonates with me is um, that, you know, the student uh, didn't need to purchase textbooks for that particular semester, and they were able to purchase a uh, a calculator in place because they needed a calculator to do higher level math and so uh they didn't have the burden of you know this huge textbook cost and they were able to use that money instead to purchase something else that they needed so um that's just one story yeah that's very true there are, uh, many of our students um have basic needs that aren't met um that um, we don't have slides on the statistics around that but um Many of them are housing insecure, uh, food insecure, um, and trying to uh, also attend school. And can you imagine being hungry and trying to actually learn new material and do your homework? It's so, yeah, I think that really touches our hearts. Christina, do you have a story from um, Henry Ford? Well, uh, not a particular story with one student, but uh, First, I guess that the professional development that you asked earlier, it was, it, it's an ongoing effort for us uh, just to, to send links to different type of support that is out there for our faculty members. Uh, we don't have anything organized yet for this year, but we will continue with that. And I think MCO will continue with the Friday faculty conversation. That is very important. I gotta say that our colleagues from the liberal arts are the ones that lead our institution in the adoption of, of OER and also uh, the Department of Engineering. It is the great work of our instructor, Hassan Namegi, who created almost, I think, an entire free uh, pre engineering program. It is based on OER. So I think that is, that is very inspiring for us. Um, so uh, in, in the school of STEM, still, we are very much standardized with the way that we have textbooks and lab manuals, but whenever I can, you know, I offer to my students, you know, OER so they can, you know, they can expand the horizon when learning, not just from the textbook. Yeah, and I, I know with the STEM courses that that's, that's a tough one because there's the homework systems, there's the lab manuals. Um, there's a lot of things that need to be addressed, whereas in liberal arts, there's less. And so they do tend to be the first adopters, um, but you know, slowly but surely, right? 
um, and trying to remove the burden of cost where you can. Yeah, I, I, the, the looks like Tracy posted a question here about uh, instructional designers uh, in their OER efforts at their institutions. I just wanted to go ahead and say absolutely, because uh, our department is primarily responsible for OERs on our campus. It's not the library. It's it's the uh, Department of Online Learning. And so uh, our instructional designer, Edie Erickson, was absolutely crucial in the success of our Achieving the Dream grant. And so um, I think that uh, it's, it really is gives you an opportunity to work as a team with subject matter experts, with faculty, and with instructional designers, and even graphic designers, web designers, um, accessibility, web accessibility specialists. It really gives you an opportunity to, when you're moving from a publisher's product to an OER, revamp your class to say really what are my outcomes that I'm most concerned about and uh, re and vinegar re you know just re-energize and you know the 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 faculty's passion for teaching that class so yeah we do uh, uh, we we do use instructional designers here to work on the team and I think they're a crucial part of the team. Yeah, thank you for that question, Tracy. And um, it's not too surprising that both Joseph and <laughs> Shinta are um, online directors or deans, uh, essentially. Um, and and the OER connection is so strong. And I'm sure, um, Christina, that at Henry Ford, you have a very strong connection. Or, or I don't know if online reports into you or it's a, more of a, a sideways connection, but um, they are, prior to the pandemic, uh, they were the first, uh, often the people who were teaching online were the first adopters of OER because mm -hmm. they understood digital materials and it was very easy for them to envision using them in their courses. And of course, providing hard copies were needed for students. And Shinta, would you like to share something about um, your work as well? Absolutely. Well, in terms of, I just want to echo what Joseph had mentioned, our instructional designers are critical players. And I put this in chat, but I recognize that not everybody can read the chat. Um, but they also help deliver workshops and they meet with faculty on a regular basis. They offer um, these seminars and, and fellowships on a regular basis. But I wanted to also go back to Una, you had asked about a story. And we have so many stories because you can imagine our institution is so big. Um, but, uh, but these stories, they just, they, they tug at your heartstrings, right? Because we sometimes, many of us tend to forget that that people have lives, students have lives outside of the classroom. They still have um, childcare responsibilities. We have a lot of students who are parents. They are responsible for being a, a, a co-breadwinner to their parents' household. They, um, just a lot of things going on, not to mention gas prices are, are still pretty high and food prices are still pretty high, et cetera. So when we hear these stories and we hear it pretty often, um, it really does, It's that you know that you just have to do something about it. And it goes back to what was said earlier about how open education, it really is the essence of why we are in higher ed in the first place. And we're here to share, we're here to, to impart knowledge on, on others, but also hear from others as well and learn from them. So, um, so I just wanted to offer that, that story. Thank you. Una, um, I have a very, I know we're down to the last couple of minutes, but I have a really quick question for Joseph, if yeah. you don't mind. Um, sure. Joseph, you mentioned you um, work and you check all the accessibility on the OERs that you uh, implement. And we do the same thing at Baker College. Um, we're all about accessibility in the instructional design department. And we find that we end up doing quite a bit of work you mentioned alt tags and you know headings and you know you know it it's it it's time consuming do you ever pass that information along to the platforms where you get you do i do um okay. yeah i've actually i want to mention the names of the institutions where we've gotten some materials because they were very large universities actually mm -hmm. one of them okay. was and um and uh, they were not, ex they were just, you know, there's a lot of missing parts with the accessibility to this particular OER. And so we did the work um, because it was important to us. And um, and we did, we shared it back with them. Uh, we got videos captioned, we got uh, alt tags on some pretty complex images that were, you know, that were just, that were images that were, you know, 
Um, there was no description for what was going on in that image. And so we addressed those concerns. And uh, because I think that's the opportunity when you're doing that work, when you're transitioning and you're building materials and your own LMS, kind of like what we were doing, uh, it was the opportunity to make it right. You know, and so we just, uh, it's as you know, it's much easier to put the re-rod in and then pour the concrete over top of that uh, instead of having, well, jackhammer up all the concrete and put the re-rod in and then pour the concrete all over again. And so uh, it gave us an opportunity and we always share back. We always share back with uh, the, the because, you know, first of all, all that information came from them. And so, and, and then it is again, again, what makes this whole movement, uh, still a movement and a really uh, passionate movement is that the resharing back of that, you know, we're making it a little better, making it a little better, making it a little better. So yeah, I think that's important to share back. Okay, great. Thank you. I appreciate that. I've often thought we needed to share back and I just was not sure who to contact. So I guess email somebody from the platform is what we'll do next time. Thank you. Well, it is three o'clock. I want to thank all of our panelists uh, for a wonderful presentation. And we hope that everyone enjoyed uh, what you heard today. Thank you so much, Kelly. And yes, thank you, Christina, Joseph, and Shinta. Um, it's amazing what you're all doing and um, the successes that you're making possible through your work.